So this is a UV disk of a, this is a UV disk graph. Basically what this tells you is that whether, because when you make something, uh, you have a test tube full of product or what, what, or what you think is product, but you don't really know because well, you can't just, you, you can't just spec, I mean, you can't just guess that it's what you want it to be. So we have to do a certain amount of tests. So you take some of that product and you put it into a cube bed and put it into a solvent that it likes. So in, our, in my case, it was dichloromethane. And you run it through this UV, UV uh, spectrometer. And what this does is that it uh, shoots light from, uh, from a desired wavelength to another desired wavelength. So in my case, it was 300 nanometers to 800 nanometers. And it records on which nanometer this product absorbed light. And depending on that, you can tell what you have inside. You can't see it, but uh, you can tell that this is a port frame or this is thalassinate and this is the metal based thalassinate. So uh, the y, I mean the x-axis is your wavelength axis and the y-axis is your absorbance. So um, the red, the red graph that you see here, that's the free TPP. So if you take some TPP and you do this test, you'll get a peak at 416. And then if you zoom in on this part here, you'll see a whole bunch of bumps from all that from 500 to all the way to 800. When you metal a portion, according to literature, you still get that uh, huge peak at 416, but you lose all of that bumps and you get one sharp peak at 540-ish. So when we did that, we basically um, did this test and basically realized that, okay, we have our product. We don't worry about it. it. might have some junk in it. It might, be, it might not be 100% pure, but at least we have draconian GDP. So we did the same thing with uh, thalassinates. So, uh, but unlike porphyrins, thalassinates is a different graph, obviously. It's a different compound. They're absorbed by a different wavelength. So free-based thalassinates um, has two peaks. One at 660 and one at 700, or around 700. And when you metalate a thalassinate, according to literature, you're supposed to have uh, a peak at four, uh, 614 and one big peak at 680-ish. And that's what we got. So we know that we have metalated PC, both half the events are from These are NMR spectra. NMR stands for nuclear resonance, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. And basically what NMR is tell you uh, when you, you put a product in, in the NMR machine, and basically it gives you, this is a proton NMR, so basically it tells you exactly where these, where the proton, um, hydrogen bonds are, basically. So all of these peaks, every one of these peaks represent one hydrogen bond on your product. And if you, if you uh, number these uh, hydrogen bonds, you can, like, you, you can number these peaks. And you can uh, look at how far they are apart, and uh, this will tell you more about your structure, product structure. So through this NMR structure, and we also did a Colby spectra, when, when you combine those two data together, you can kind of come up with an image like this. So this is, uh, this is my polyexomelate. That yellow ball inside of it is the metal. In this case, it was zirconium. And then this is important. So this is a computer generated picture, right? it's not a real picture, but I showed you earlier, Portman's absorbed light at 420, around 400 nanometers. So that's, that's all the high intensity lights. Um, wavelengths at 420, that's basically all the blue lights, blue, purple, even some green. So Portman's absorb all of that light. When you, uh, when you look at the, when you look at the light that's coming from our sun, it, uh, it, gives us, it gives us all types of light. It gives us red light, yellow light, and everything. That's why you have a rainbow. Um, most of what it gives us is red. So you want to absorb all the blue light because those are the high energy lights. But unfortunately, there's not that much of it. Most of that, what we get from the sun is red and yellow light. 
That's why we started working with Port, I mean, Dallas Hines, because Dallas Hines absorb light at a higher wavelength, which uh, around six, from 650 to 700, that's more, mostly the red light. That's why uh, when we make this, these uh, dyes, these solar cell dyes, we want to somehow put, the, put a mixture of uh, porphyrins and thalassinins, or maybe have one slide that's porphyrin, one slide that's thalassinin, or something like that. So these are some of the pictures uh, of the nanoparticles, the TiO2 bonded with the porphyrins and the thalassinins. So this side is the porphyrin, this side is the thalassinin. So as you can see, uh, so I'm going to go back and forth. So um, what we concluded was that the zirconium TPP is very stable, a lot stable than half the MTPP, because the zirconium TPP stays intact even when you put it onto the oxide plate. Whereas the half the TPP breaks down. As you can see, that it's all over, all over this in the solution. And here, the zirconium TPP uh, falls down, and this is all centrifuge, by the way. And then when you dry this, uh, when you dry this, this is, uh, we didn't even bother with the half inch TPP because it didn't work. So when we dry this, this, this is what it looks like. This is basically what will go on top of the soil. So this is your transparent glass, this is your titanium dioxide, and your portion on top of it. So we did the same thing with. Uh, Bellasinians, we realized Bellasinians are a lot more stable than um, Portland's. Um, Bellasinians are uh, incredibly stable compared to Portland's. As you can see, zirconium, whether it's zirconium or hafnium, there's a matter they're both very, they very, uh, they load onto the TiO2 dye very, um, very strongly. And when you make the plates, then there, it, it's not a comparison. It's, if you add more titanium dioxide, it will, it will uh, make this uh, solution very colorless. At least the time. So that, that's basically what it is. So as I said earlier, uh, metal and thalassines are very uh, stable compared to the porphyrins. And however, zirconium porphyrins are a lot more stable than the hafnium porphyrins. And we can conclude this from the pictures that we took. So for my future studies, um, currently, currently we're just writing, but I do want to look at uh, crystal structures of these things. Or I want to look at the uh, zirconium porphyrin palm crystal structures. These are hafnium palm crystal structures. And basically, if you have a crystal structure, you can put it under a microscope and you get real images. These are Real images. The, the images that I showed you, the, the, the diagrams that I showed you from the NMR spectrum, those are all computer generated. But this is a real image. So when you have a real image, it's very easy to convince other people uh, that the product you're talking about is actually the product that you have. Uh, and I want to do this with uh, zirconium portraits, I mean, I have um, zirconium portraits and uh, metal related PC, both hafnium and zirconium. And of course, the long-term goal is to uh, find an alternate dye that can, uh, that can solve our problems with the solar cells that are currently out there and make this a lot cheaper. These are some of my references. And um, I want to acknowledge Dr. Uh, Professor Dre and Professor Francis Goni. Uh, I want to acknowledge Ben. He, he was my lab partner for the first year. And Ivana, she was lab, my lab partner for the second two years. Um, Alex, Dr. Al, Alex Fowler, I used his thesis for most of my work. Um, Dr. Sad, of course, and HCS, and all of you guys. Thank you. Good question.
no energy lights that are coming from the sun. But uh, our sun emits mostly red and yellow light. So although we didn't look at uh, anions of absorption because this is a very uh, chemistry-based project, but I'm guessing because our uh, sun emits more red light, the valentines, which are blue, they absorb most of the red light. They would be more energy efficient compared to the corporates, which absorb the blue light. Yeah. Conclusion. Uh,